In part one of this presentation, we looked at some pictures of sloping planes intersecting with circular cones. We suggested that the cross sections looked like they might be circles, ellipses, parabolas or hyperbolas. We then went on to establish the equations for the circular cone and for a sloping plane. For the cone, we have the first equation that I've presented here again. Here it's important to realise that the parameter alpha measures the slope of the side of the cone. Slope is either plus or minus alpha. As for the plane, well, more normally we see z related to both x and y and a constant. But I claimed that because the cone is circular, the orientation of the plane didn't make any difference, so we could safely leave out the x variable. I've drawn some graphs with Mathematica below to try and make this clearer. In the first graph, I've drawn this is the plane z equals ay plus b. You can see that we're looking at it almost from the side and it cuts through the cone. Notice that this plane does not intersect the x-axis. You could imagine rotating the first diagram by 90 degrees. In that case we would get the same picture as the second one here. However, that picture actually is z equals ax plus b. You see that the because the, the cone is circular, rotating the plane doesn't really make any difference. A plane that relates z with x and y would be intermediate between these two, but it would still cut the cone in exactly the same way. I'm therefore going to make life simpler for myself by using just ay plus b on the right hand side. Notice that the gradient of that plane, as viewed from the side, is then just the parameter a. So now I'm going to go through every possible case of the way that that plane could intersect the cone, and I should establish the equations of all the various conic sections we've referred to before. We'll start with the simplest case of all, that in which a and b are both zero. If a and b are zero, then the plane equation tells me that z must be zero. If I substitute z equals zero into the plane equation, I get the following. The only possible solution of this equation for x and y is that both x and y are zero. That just gives us the point at the origin. Some people would refer to it as a circle of radius zero. So this plane is dead flat because the gradient a is zero, it passes through the origin because the parameter b is zero and that means that it cuts the cones at the place where they meet, right at their tips. Well that was a rather trivial case but it did have to be covered. Let's now look at the case where a is zero but b is some constant, call it maybe capital R. In that case we get z equals R. We have to substitute that into the cone equation. Here's the result and of course we get circles in the xy plane x squared plus y squared equals r squared over alpha squared. They're circles of radius capital R over alpha. Do you remember we said circles were amongst our curves forming the conic sections? Well there we are, we've now proved it. A horizontal plane lifted above the origin but flat cuts the cone in circles. Exactly what we might have expected for a circular cone of course. Let's move on to the third case. This time I'll take b to be 0, but a to be non-zero. So now we have z equals ay. Looked at from the side, this would just be a straight line through the origin. As a three-dimensional entity, it's a plane sloping through the origin. Now, the way it cuts the cone will depend on the value a. To try to picture it, the cone has slope alpha. If a is less than alpha, then there should be no intersection with the cone apart from that at the origin, where the two tips meet. As a increases, the plane will eventually just touch the side of the cone and then eventually cut it. Let's see this happening by substituting this z into our cone equation. Here's the result. I've substituted z equals ay on the left. Let's rearrange this equation. We have alpha squared x squared plus 
alpha squared minus a squared y squared equals 0. So suppose a is less than alpha. So now we get something positive times x squared plus something positive times y squared equals 0. The only way that can happen is the solution we had before x equals y equals 0. Since z is equal to a y, that means that z is also 0, and so we get the point O. That's not really very interesting. What about if a equals alpha? Now we get alpha squared x squared equals 0, and the y term disappears. That means that x must be 0, but of course we're still left with z equals a y. That is precisely a line of slope a which runs up the side of the cone, since a is equal to alpha. The same would be true if a is minus alpha. We could put plus or minus here. OK, I think that's what you'd expect. The plane just passing through the origin, but running up the edge of the cone, just touching it as a tangent plane to the side of the cone. The intersection is just a straight line running up the edge. Finally, if A is bigger than alpha, our plane now cuts both the cones, but passes through the origin. The place where it cuts the cones are simply straight lines up the side of the cones. This time, though, oriented differently. We get the straight line equation. z equals a y equals plus or minus a alpha over root a squared minus alpha squared x. Up to this point, this hasn't really been very interesting, has it? Just points and straight lines, and yes, luckily we did find the circles. We're still looking for the ellipses, parabolas, and hyperbolas. We need to make z as general as possible now. z equals a y plus b. I'll substitute that into the cone equation now, and then expand it on the left. Here's the expansion. It's just multiplying two brackets together. I'm going to collect this in a suggestive way. With x squared and y squared terms on the left, and yes, a y term as well, but a constant on the right, we can now see the beginnings of the possibility of having ellipses, parabolas, or hyperbolas. The simplest case is the parabola. Do you remember in part one, I said the parabola occurs when the plane and the cone have the same slope? That means a equals plus or minus alpha. In that case, the y squared term will disappear. Let's see what that gives us. The y squared has disappeared, and I've reorganize the terms so that the linear term in y is on one side and the x squared and constant stuff is on the other. You can now immediately see that this is the equation of a parabola. In fact it's y equals alpha squared x squared minus b squared either over plus or minus 2 alpha b. Definitely the equation of a parabola. Depending on the plus or minus sign, the parabola will be one way round or the other. Now, just because we need to keep referring to it, let's circle our equation that we're still dealing with. What happens if a is less than alpha? So, if a is less than alpha, then we have something that's positive times x squared and alpha squared minus a squared is also positive, so that's plus positive times y squared minus a 2ab y term equals b squared. I hope you recognize that as the equation of an ellipse. It's not got its center at the origin because of the 2ab y term, but it is definitely an ellipse because the, po the uh, coefficients of x squared and y squared are both positive. That does correspond to what we looked at in part one, when the plane just started to slope out of the horizontal.
we transited from a circle to something that looked like an elongated circle. Now we see that we really did have an ellipse. Just the hyperbola to go now. That must be the one missing case. If a is bigger than alpha, now going back to our red equation there, now the alpha squared minus a squared is negative. So we've got positive lot of x squared, but a negative lot of y squared. And still the minus 2abY term, and b squared on the other side. And show sure enough, with plus x squared and minus y squared type terms, the, again, the 2abY term doesn't interfere, it just shifts the centre, so we should recognise that as the equation of an hyperbola. So we've now re uh, we, we, we've, so we've now recovered all the equations of the conic sections, and my task is finished.